everyone got the slides? Okay, I'll um, I'll take you through. So today, what we're um, we're going to look at is um, is business planning. I mean, essentially, business plan on a page for your for your startup business. Um, we're we're going to say first of all, I'm going to sort of say why why do you need a business plan? Other people have probably said to you, um, oh, you know, if you're starting a business, have you done your business plan yet? Um, and maybe you're thinking, do I really need that? It's just me. Do I really need a plan? Um, you may have gone further down that route. You may have been thinking, I need a business plan and I've started Googling and I've started getting some ideas, but I'm not quite sure. And I just want to test out my thoughts on that. So we'll have a look at, we'll, we'll talk about what, what a business plan could look like. Um, and then what I want really to focus on today is exploring the one page approach to business plan planning, which is, um, I think, is, is a really good way for a startup business to capture exactly what it is, the essence of your business and, and where you're going. And, and as we go through, I'll, I'll explain, um, explain that in more detail and hopefully give you some tips that you can that you can take away and will, will help you with, with your planning. So the first question, why, why do you need to create a business plan? Is it for yourself or is it for others? For yourself, you could be just needing to capture in one place what it is you're doing. For others, um, that could be that you're looking to apply for funding, you need to apply for finance, that possibly you're looking at having an investor or there's more than you involved in the startup business and you want to have this shared vision and the shared idea of where you're going and, and just capturing it in one place um, is actually really, really helpful and useful thing to do. Um, because quite often you find, particularly with startup businesses, where there's a, a couple of friends or a couple of former colleagues who've come together, um, you think you've got a shared vision, you think you've got a shared idea of where you're going, but actually as things progress, you, you, your thoughts and your ideas um, can begin to diverge. And so actually having this, this this one thing, this, this document, this, this business plan can give you that single point of reference and that, that can be huge help. So really it's just thinking about when you're creating your plan, who, who it's for. Um, if it's for funders, if you're, if you're gonna be applying for grant funding, I can tell you that um, Oxlap and the team at Oxlap who are reviewing grant applications will welcome a business plan on a page um, that gives a really concise overview. Yes, you will need to provide some supplementary information and be able to back everything up, but it gives the, the person who's making the assessment um, a really quick and concise view of what you're doing. If you're going to be looking um, for, for finance, if you're gonna be um, making an application to something like the startup loan company, um, or to your own bank, then again, they will want to see what this business is. You know, they don't, what they don't want to see is a long rambling email from yourself with all your thoughts and ideas and a number or two at the bottom of the page. Equally, a huge weighty tome. You know, actually, are they going to read all the way through it? So, you know, be, be thinking about that. If it, it, it could be that you're going to be self-financing that you you don't need to go for funding but again as I've mentioned having a business plan for yourself or for your your, your colleagues and partners um, is helpful it will give you clarity it will make sure it'll help you um, be clear that you understand all the aspects of running your business and also it'll help you set some realistic goals and targets and know what you need to do to reach those. So particularly if, if, there's, if there's more than you, there's two people, then it gives you this point of reference to come back to and you can monitor your progress. So what could a business plan look like? I don't know how many of you have Googled business plan template. Um, I don't know how many of you have downloaded templates. Um, I think it's fair to say that Historically, um, a business plan was quite a hefty document. Um, 
in my past, I worked um, with the advisory accountancy company KPMG, and I spent years producing business plans. And I think our clients um, seem to equate fees with the number of pages in the business plan. Um, I think, fortunately, I think we've all moved on from that. And actually having something that is concise and clear can be really helpful. And particularly when you're starting up, if you've downloaded one of those Google Word templates that has all that has the contents page there for you, and it has all the chapter headings, the chances are that you've allocated, you're going to spend a day or by the end of this week, you'll have your marketing chapter ended. And then next week, you're going to look at operations. And then you're going to look at people or people management. And then you're going to start looking at your suppliers. The chances are by the end of the month, you've already missed your targets. You still haven't got all of that filled out. The other risk is that you go down in silos. You focus on each chapter. You focus on getting all of that together. But as you're doing it, your thinking's evolving. But then that would mean you'd have to go back and completely revisit or rewrite the other chapter. So, yes, there's a place for a, a, a chunky business plan with lots of pages and lots of different headings. What we really recommend, particularly when you're starting up, is, is a business plan on a page. It's where you can see it there and you can easily change your ideas and, and update things. I'm just going to welcome as a few people have joined us um, and apologies for the delay, everyone. Um, there was a problem with the with the link at the beginning. I think um, a combination of Zoom and Eventbrite um, gremlins in the system. So apologies for that. Um, I'm, I'm Leslie McKee. I'm, I'm running this, this session here. My colleague Ant is also in the chat. Um, he's waving his hands at you. Um, at the end of the session, we'll be having questions and answers, and, and Ant will also be sending out Pack. And I know he's pressed record button as well, so there there will be the chance to to, to catch up. Um, we're also um, using chat. If you've got any specific questions, start dropping them in chat, and we'll be having a quick look at those while while I'm um, carrying on with the the presentation. Um, but thanks for joining us, and thanks for sticking with us with the the technical problems. Um, so, yeah, we're just really at the moment talking about the, what your business plan could look like and the sort of, if you like, the, the more sort of historic or conventional big word document with lots of chapters and lots of words in it versus this simple um, one page approach, um, which we would say for, for a startup business is definitely the best way to, to, to get out the starting blocks. It basically, it, it enables you to create a snapshot your business idea to really get into the essence of what your product and service is but also break down into the key parts what you need to do in order to deliver that product or service and what that looks like in terms of your um, income and expenditure as well so it sounds like a lot in one page it is but it really um, help you help you focus this is what it looks like it looks a bit stark, but this is an empty, if you like, um, business um, model canvas, business plan canvas. Um, it will, will help you fill it out. But basically, there are nine boxes. And I've, um, th there's a really interesting sort of theory to this of why, it, why it's the sort of the nine boxes and why they're laid out this way. And it's because the... the um, there were some um, business academics at a, at a conference uh, a number of years ago. The conference was in Japan. They'd been discussing business strategy. They'd been sharing, you know, how whether one thing, one aspect of business should take priority over another. Where, where should you start with, with business planning or with your business strategy? Um, they were still thinking about this. They hadn't arrived at an answer when they got on the plane home. And the, the, the meal tray on the plane arrived. And it was actually, the conference was in Japan, and the meal that arrived was actually in a, in a bento tray. And they realised then that, that, that this idea of having everything on the one, 
on the one tray in its own separate compartment, but offering balance and complementarity um, was actually the sort of the vision that they were looking for. And that was a sort of light bulb moment for the, for the, the business model canvas, that everything is equal, everything's related and it's balanced and it's, it's in the box. So that's your um, little snippet for today on where, where an idea for a bento box um, went to. The, the other thing to be thinking about this, but we'll look in more detail in a minute, but broadly, on the right hand side, the boxes on the right hand side of the, um, the canvas are about the desirability of your business. It's about your customers, it's about your markets, it's about how you're going to reach them, it's about how they're going to find out about you. And it's, it's, it's quite sort of um, outward looking, if you like, and, it, and it's about, you know, getting your great idea your customers or your clients and how you engage with them. The left-hand side is much more about the feasibility. It's much more about the, how am I gonna do this? And who do I need to help me do this? This is about you know, your, your key channels, your key partners, the, the activities that you need to be undertaking, whether that's you know, bookkeeping, packaging, um, manufacturing, who, who's going to do that and and you know who are who, who are they what are they going to cost what are the what are the, um, the things associated with their production where are they located um, so you're identifying all of those things on the left hand side and then encompassing all of that and at the bottom is your is the viability so you know what it's going to take to produce your product and to run your business you know who your customers are and how you're going to engage with them. But actually, you need to know from those what the cost base are, what your revenue streams are. And actually, does this great idea stack up? Is it viable? So what we're trying to achieve with this um, business plan on the page is getting that balance um, so that you're not running, you know, focusing, let's say, on um, a product or on a customer group, which actually aren't generating the revenues that you need or are particularly um, costly and the margins aren't there for you. So what this, this can help you um, visualize there. So what we'll, we'll look at in a little bit more detail is what you'd expect um, to, to be looking at in each of those boxes. Um, in the middle is, is, is your value proposition. This is about being clear in your own mind about what is the customer problem that you're solving. This isn't about what is it am I selling or what is the service that I'm offering? This is about what is the problem that I'm solving? Because once you understand that, it will be much easier to communicate with your customers because they will understand what problem it is that you're solving for them rather than what it is you're selling them. We'll jump over to the right hand side there with the customer segments. So again, really important to think really carefully about who are your customers and get to get as much detail as you can about it, drill it right down. Um, if you're very general on who your customers are, then you will find it very difficult to effectively target them and effectively engage with them. Um, you know, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who's planning to, to set up a business and his focus at the moment was on um, retail premises. Um, so he, he's looking at having a high street or at least a street presence. And his focus was on the size of the premises and what he could afford he actually hadn't thought through who his target customers were. He's got a very specific offer. Um, it's in the, um, and he was looking for environmentally conscious and, and ethically minded consumers um, and had a very specific offer. He needs to be where they are or where they can easily get to. Um, and the, 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 those two things haven't added up yet. He was, looking at, he was looking at what's available in terms of premises, 
but also drilling down on the clarity of who his customers are. But you need to marry the two. In his in, in this instance, you know, he potentially was looking at a corner shop in a residential area, but the profile of the residents in that area didn't match with his product offer. So really understanding your customer segments, getting the, the, the geography, getting the age groups, getting the, um, the, the family structure, the life stage, the buying habits. What's quite useful as well is thinking somebody who will buy my service or product, you know, would shop at, you know, Waitrose, Sainsbury's, Lidl, Marks and Spencer's Food Hall, local refill store, beginning to think about those things will then begin to help you understand how to reach them. So the more you can do on identifying your customers, the better. Um, the next box I'm gonna look at is, is customer relationships and what, who are your competitors and what are they doing? And are you going to do the same? Are you going to do that differently? How are people going to access your products or services? Are you going to have a high street presence? Are you going to have a shop? Is it going to be, is it a bespoke offer? Will people need to contact you and have a discussion with you about how you're going to help them and what your service actually is? Is it going to be, is it going to be completely hands off? Will it just be completely online ordering? You know, they'll go online, they'll order something, it'll all be automated and it'll be delivered to them and you'll never actually speak to them. So there's a whole spectrum there. It might be that if you've got a bespoke offer, you might also want to have um, some off the shelf sort of products or services as well. Understanding what you're going to do there will then help you to understand if you're thinking about the left hand side of your your, your um uh, plan here what the key activities are who your business partners are um a lot of online businesses are, are very successful but you've got to remember that sometimes you can be dependent on one channel is that a good thing or a bad thing um I've spoken to someone recently who said she just doesn't want to use Etsy, for example, because it doesn't allow her enough scope to um, get through the ethos of her business and her branding. Other people have said not on the high street is where they'll go. And then they've looked actually at the, at the costs and the overheads and the margins. It just doesn't stack up. Um, other people have a dependency. Facebook. Um, Oh, it's almost two years ago now, Facebook went down for a week and all of those businesses that were dependent on Facebook for their marketing and some of them who were doing Facebook um, sort of retail and selling direct lost all their sales. And there were some significant businesses in the US who lost two weeks worth of business at the busiest time of year in the run up to Black Friday. Um, so if it's just a case of identifying those things and understanding the risks and also looking at what your service is compared to your competitors. Dropping below that are the channels. And this is about thinking about how you're going to reach people. Um, and there's a number of different stages in that process as well. How are people going to um, become aware of you? Are you going to have a website? Are you going to have a high street presence with signage? Are you going to have branded vehicles? Um, what, how are people going to become aware about, of you? How are they then going to be able to evaluate before they make a purchase? Um, so that typically could be um, you know, customer testimonials on your website. It could be the reviews that other people have placed. It could be the opportunity to try something. It could be an introductory offer. Um, it could be a recommendation from a friend. So thinking about those channels and what you're going to do to raise awareness, to allow people to sort of have a look around in their minds, evaluate what channels they're going to use to actually make the purchase. What you're then going to do in terms of after sales. Are you you know, are you going to make offers? Are you going to follow up with a, um, with a letter? Are you going to invite people to join your email list? 
Are you then going to send out email newsletters or other correspondence to, to your customers? Are you going to have a Facebook group or a social media group that you'll engage people with? There's a lot in there. And for a startup business, we tend to think about the channels that we're most comfortable with or the things that we've that we've engaged with in the past. But again, it's thinking about your customers, which is the right thing for them. Um, you know, if your target audience is under the age of 25, then using Facebook as your primary channel probably isn't going to be very effective. If your um, audience is um, sort of older, um, or maybe if you're looking at a specific geography, um, actually putting a really nice card or letter or flyer through the letterbox might still work. You know, if, if, if it's students you're targeting and there's, you know, nobody looks at the mail and student houses, that might be effective. But for other things, actually print might be effective. Um, so it's really thinking through matching your channels with your customer segments is really important. I'm going to move over to the left hand side now. Um, and I'm going to start at this uh, box, um, key activities. So this, this is probably a list, probably quite a long list that you start with. Um, but these are the most important things that your business needs to do. We've been talking about marketing and customers and customer research and customer engagement. That's important, but there are other things as well. Are you making things? Are you engaging with other people who are making things? Are you um, running premises? Do you need other skills in there? Are you um, buying materials? Are you invoicing? Are you handling cash? There's a whole range of things you need to think through and identify all of the different things that your business will be doing and then begin to think about, you know, what are the most important ones and who's going to do them? Can you do them? Can you do all of them? Are there ways in which you can um, outsource or are there apps or um, different processes or systems that you can use? That will help you with those and that takes us down to the um the box below that the key resources what are the assets that you need in order to deliver your products or services you know do you do you need a do you need a professional um account with with zoom do you are you going to be designing and doing things do you need um adobe acrobat or will something like canva help you out um, do you need a digital accounting platform um, most businesses do these days and you definitely will if you're going to be fat registered um, do you need premises do you need maybe you're going to be doing an online business but you may need a warehouse you may need just some storage space do you get that list together work out what what the priorities are there it may be that some of those things you don't need immediately. So also start thinking about the timeliness of it. There are certain things that, you know, it might be good. Your accountant could be your best friend. You might need them immediately. But it may be that as your business grows, you might be able to, you, your knowledge will develop. It may be that you can bring a bookkeeper in and therefore your, your accountant is, is less important. Still a very important person but possibly less important. So getting that list together would be really helpful. On the left-hand side here are the key partners. Um, I mentioned that example earlier about Facebook going down. Who are the businesses, the suppliers, that without them, your business couldn't function? Because that's, that's where the risk is at the moment. I don't know how many of you are experienced. I've got a construction or building project on at the moment. I don't know how many of you are involved in that area, but at the moment there's real um, disruption to supply chains. 
and it's affecting a lot of businesses um, in terms of their ability to deliver and their cash flow. Um, so understanding who your key suppliers are, but also potentially what your alternatives could be, will be really important to the health of your business going forward. So the example I had recently was um, someone coming to fit the windows um, to a new build um, that, that we have, in fact, a new home office so that one of us can go and sit outside. And this guy was saying he's now having to take delivery of doors um, from his manufacturer, but they're having to sit in his storage. So he's having to expand his storage and he's having to pay for them, but he can't fit them for his customers. So therefore he can't get payment because these doors don't have any locks or handles on them. And the reason they don't have any locks or handles on them is because they've got somewhere in the global distribution disruption, these locks and handles um, have got, they're either stuck in sewers or they're stuck in a container that's going the wrong direction around the world, or they've ended up in Rotterdam instead of Felixstowe or something. And that is happening all over in lots of different sectors at the moment. So please be aware of that. And also um, the price changes that are happening as well. Um, I spoke to someone yesterday who um, is, is again also in the construction industry and he has some of the component parts um, that he's using have tripled in price in six months, but he put the court out and, and, and the customer signed the agreement nine months ago. So he's now having to back and renegotiate on his prices. So think, think about your terms and conditions as well, if you're in, in those sorts of sectors, but identifying your key partners and, and suppliers and potential alternatives would be um, a really important part of a successful startup. I'm going to move down to the bottom now, um, to the cost structure and the revenue streams. These are the financial parts of your, of your business plan. What you're wanting to do for your costs is identify um, what, what will it cost you to set up this business and then what will it cost you to run the business. So you may have set up costs that are, that are one off, um, but then you will have ongoing costs as well. And your ongoing, ongoing costs will comprise of fixed costs and variable costs. So the fixed costs are the things you just have to have and spend every month, insurance, for example. Variable costs will probably de will be dependent on the, um, the, the level of business that you're doing. It could be raw materials, it could be ingredients, it could be staff if you're working on um, sort of flexible staffing. So you'll have costs that you incur every month, regardless of what level of trade you're doing. And then on top of that, you will have the costs that are related to the volume of activity. You, when you, as you're looking at your costs, um, identify your setup costs and then look at your operating. So from, from day one, when you open, in effect, open your doors, start trading, um that will help you separate the two out and move over to the revenue streams what you want to be looking at here is again this takes you back to your customers and to your products um, you may want to look at your revenues um, by customer type you may want to look at your revenues by your different um, types of product or service um, You've also got to take into account the costs associated with those, um, such as um, subscription fees. You know, if you if you're using, let's say you've chosen to use Mailchimp, um, or you're using um, Facebook to to reach people. Yes, Facebook's free to a point. Or if you're using LinkedIn promotions, you will have, in effect, advertising costs. You will have marketing costs associated with reaching people. So don't forget about factoring those in. The more people you want to reach, the costs will go up as well. Um, so it's really important that you're, you're looking at your revenue streams and then really what you're then looking to do 
with your costs and your revenues is build a cash flow forecast that will sh that will give you an indication of when you're going to reach um, profitability. And then you can begin to look at when you can start paying yourself from the business and also um, looking at addressing those startup costs. There's a lot in there, but it's all on a page and you can do it. And I, believe me, it, it's easier doing it this way than it is writing hundreds and hundreds of words on a Word document and going down those, um, those, those silos and then wondering where on earth you are when you come back up and then thinking, actually, I am going to have to print this out and I'm going to probably have to mark it up and sort it out. This actually is, is, can be very visual and I'll, um, I'll move on to that um, next. I just want to take you through this um, uh, model for, um, for Airbnb. Hopefully you've all managed to get a break over the, over the last few months. It's been a really, a really strange one, hasn't it? Maybe some of you even have a business plan that is around visitor accommodation. They'll do really well. Um, I know the, the farm in my village, their, their coach house is fully booked until Christmas and has been fully booked since lockdown lifted or before. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's a good area to be in. But again, there's, there are risks if we go through a, a fire break of October half term that will upset a few businesses in, in this area. But there's a couple of things I just wanted to um, pull out from the from the Airbnb um, plan. Um, the first is that they've got two value propositions because the Airbnb is one of those businesses. It sort of sits and it's got it's actually got two different customers. The business itself has got um, accommodation hosts as customers, so they've got a value property proposition for the hosts, the people who are wanting to rent out their room their apartment, their, um, their glamping site, actually, looking at Karen's lovely tents behind her there. Um, and what they offer the host is, um, you know, is, is, is a way of generating income, easy transactions, um, a, a degree of security that, that the guests, people that are booking have been verified in some way, and also a way for um, the host to actually manage bookings and it's a calendar system. So that's they've got a value proposition for the hosts, but they've also got a value proposition for guests, which is you and me um, and the people who are not selling their rooms or their glamping site, but the people that actually want to go away for a short break, not stay in an anonymous hotel, um, what they're offering is more variety when you're staying away. They're offering ratings, validate you know, all the reviews, everything's in there for the for the premises that you're going to stay in. Um, one of their early things was about these authentic local experiences, that you're actually going to stay in a building or in a location which fits, you know, it's you know, I'm going to Edinburgh next month. I want to stay either in the quirky old town or in a really nice, um, if my budget will allow, sort of Georgian apartment in the new town. I don't want to stay in a travel lodge halfway between the city centre and the airport, because I could be anywhere. So what I'll, you know, I'll be looking at Airbnb because that'll give me the chance to just get that full city experience. So th they've got those two value propositions. So think about this for your business as well, that you may, you may need more than one value proposition depending on who your, um, your customers are. I'm gonna move over to the customer segments here. So what um, Airbnb are having to think about with, with their customer segments um, is, you know, they're, they're looking specifically um, for, the, for the hosts, how do they, how do they reach them? What, what do they need to understand about them? Um, they, you know, they, they, want, they want a range of people. They want people who've got different types of accommodation. They've got specific demographics with hosts as well. You know, they've got younger people who, who want to have someone in their home sharing a, sharing a room. But they've equally, they've got other people who've got larger um, premises who are looking, you know, to let an annex or a property that's completely remote um, from their home. 
And with the customer segments, with their, with their guests, they've got business travellers, they've got leisure travellers, um, and then it breaks down within that. And any of you used Airbnb recently that they're now bringing in um, events, experiences, um, people can, you can now go for a you know a walking tour with someone who you know who lives in in the location that you're going to. Um, there you know you you can choose between um, a pretty basic glamping experience with a composting toilet all the way through to somebody who only wants, you know, luxury and, you know, the, the hot tub and, and everything else so that you, that you can categorise and we can target specifically. Um, I won't go through the rest of, of this today, but it just it gives you a really good example. I will bring out the bottom here on the revenues that Airbnb have got different so basically, they've got two revenue streams, one from hosts and one from the, the guests, and they have different percentages for each of those. So um, think about that again. When you're looking at your revenue streams, it might be that you have you know, different, different margins for, for different products or services. Make sure you reflect that in there. So... Could you make your own one? Could you make your own? Yeah, there's some nods. That's good. What I'm going to suggest is that the best way to do this is not to actually write or type up, but to actually get back to pen and paper and post-it notes. Get yourself a template. It's use post-it notes and use different coloured ones. I've got, actually, I've got some here from here. Here we go. This one's covered in post-it notes. This is one that I've been working with, with another group. If you use post-it notes, use the same color. So this, if you're gonna go off and do this this weekend, choose the color of post-it notes that you've got. I've got, I've got pink ones here. The pink, the pink ones are for your, um, you know, second weekend in September, go at your business plan. Write on the post-it notes. Get the get your thoughts down. Capture them there. Remember, it's the it's your key thoughts at this stage. It's the top things, and then pin the template on the wall, in your kitchen, in your office, in the hallway, wherever you're walking past, and keep looking at it. And then next weekend, and you have the time to download the thoughts. Or if if in the week actually it's been sparked. Get a different colour of post-it note and put it up and you'll begin to see as your thoughts develop where, where you're at. Because it might be that you're really clear on the left hand side of your plan. And actually, whatever you put up today, tomorrow and Sunday will, will stick because you really know that and you're really confident about that. And that would be fine. It might be that on the right hand side that, you've, that you're doing more thinking and that maybe you know you meet friends of the weekend, you're, you're talking more about your about your product, about who you think your customers will be, and you might get some input from them. If they if they if they're the sort of person that you think you would be buying your service, talk to them. And that might mean that you can update and um, and take this forward. So that it's a living business plan. It moves, it goes with you. Um, I think once you've been through several iterations, what I'd say is you could then potentially capture it in PowerPoint. It's, um, it, it's a good way to, to, to get it in one place. If you need more information, if you want to put the notes behind it, then potentially create um, a further slide for each of those boxes. So you've got 10 PowerPoint slides in total, so you've got your front one, which is your, your plan, and then a page for each of the nine boxes behind where you can capture more information. So yeah, what next? Draw an A3 or bigger template and get some sticky notes, get planning, and then keep reviewing and revising it. And Ant and the team at Oxlet are running a whole series of workshops um, and events like this for startups. So use this as your 
sort of go to that you refer back to each time you attend one of those sessions to review and revise and it, you, you you're keeping everything there and it and it, and it works um should we, i've got any questions and well, um, we haven't yet. I've just put a <laughs> message in the chat to see if there are any questions, but I'm sure, I mean, as we haven't got a huge group, I mean, if somebody wants to come off mute and ask the question in a moment, that would be great. Um, just to echo what Leslie said there, you know, the business model canvas, it's not something we've invented. Uh, you know, this has been out there for, for quite a few years and is, is widely recognised as one of the most efficient and best tools to get your business ideas together. Um, and you know, one of our advisors, Paul Holmes, um, he says that, you know, he still uses this with businesses that are turning over a million pounds because quite often the management team all have slightly different thoughts about some stuff. And rather than, you know, getting going on a big business planning exercise, it's a tool that you can get stuck into in a sort of workshop environment around a desk. You can put it up in the canteen. You can have it, as Leslie said, in your kitchen. Um, and you can start to test the thinking. Um, and, I, and I always think if, if people yeah. don't like your idea, that half the time um, it's probably a really good one. Um, so, but yeah, so there are other events. So the next one in this session is with an accountant. And don't worry, it's not boring. It's interesting, but it is about things like tax and how you set up your business and you know what sort of structure you might need and how you think about cash flow. Um, we then have um, a fantastic session from one of Leslie's friends, um, Ashley Cavers, who mm -hmm. talks about how to launch a new product or service. Um, and I say it's fantastic because Ashley is one of the founding directors of the Wonky Food Company. Um, so they make tasty relishes out of um, otherwise unusable vegetables that Morrison's and others wouldn't want. Um, and, you know, when they launched their product, it went straight onto the shelves in the co-op. So she knows how to launch a product. And then our final session in this little series is from Paul Holmes, one of our advisors, and he talks about how to make sure that your business plan is suitable for the long term, how you're planning for growth. So today has been a lot about getting those first thoughts going and, you know, if anybody's managed to create their business plan in the 40 minutes Leslie's been talking, then fantastic. But I would suggest it's going to take you a lot longer to perfect it. Um, Paul's session at the end is about thinking, well, how do you build on this and how do you make sure you're building a business that is going to give you the, the future you want? Um, we do meet an awful lot of people that have been in business for three to 10 years who are absolutely exhausted. Mm. And I'm sure that's not why they started their business. Um, so as Leslie said, there's a lot of sessions. Um, what we will do, given the mess up with this, we will email everybody to make sure that we've got absolutely the right links for the future sessions and that you can join them and register. Um, but questions then. Uh, so question in the chat there from Jan, Leslie. You begin with a single page, but when you need finance, et cetera, you then expand to meet their needs rather than my needs. Yeah, I think it depending on who you're um, making the application for finance to, but certainly the, um, the, the one page is a very good synopsis of your business and be very, that that will that will demonstrate to anyone exactly what it is you do, who your who your customers are, who your suppliers are, and what your finances look like. You probably will need to put submit um, you know a cash flow forecast um, and some additional information that that they will request, but they are unlikely to need a thirty four page word document. And, and we hear that um, all the time from wherever you are in the country. We work with different different organisations, different groups. And yes, there's usually a specific form that somebody will want filling in for certain aspects. But overall, the business plan on a page that Leslie's just demonstrated gives people a really good, quick understanding and confidence that, that you know what you're doing. 
Um, so you might need to add bits to it, but it's the right place to start. Yeah, and, definitely. And you mentioned cash flow forecast there, Leslie. So the next session that is with the accountant, he um, he will give a quick demonstration of cash flow forecasting and share a template and share a longer YouTube video that you can use to go through and make sure you do your cash flow forecasting. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, that I've found um, talking with, with startup businesses recently is is just understanding what it's going to cost you to, to actually get out, you know, before you open the doors. And then um, from day one, doing, doing your projections, but then speaking to your accountant so that you're clear on what we, I guess we could think of as the unexpected costs. So things like um, tax, um, NI, PYE related costs, um, VAT, as soon as you start hitting seven, if, if as soon as you start hitting seven thousand pounds a month, you really need to be seriously thinking about registering for VAT and understanding what the implications of that are. Um, so and, and, and the implications for your for your cash flow because that's money that you're, you're gathering for the government, but you only pay them quarterly. So that that could, if you forget about that then suddenly one month you've got a you know fairly substantial bill that you that you hadn't you hadn't even thought about and understanding when your tax is likely to be to be due as well because you know you you're not you're not an employee for, for a single organization where their big payroll structure deducts everything at source and you know now you've actually got to be responsible for your own for your own tax returns for yourself and the business you, and particularly if you set up a limited company, then there's a whole set of um, activities that are required to support that as well. Brilliant. Um, so there's no more questions coming up, but if, if anybody does have one, feel free to raise a hand or un, unmute. Um, just to, to reaffirm that there, there is lots of support available from Oxlap. I mean, this is a sample of what is available. Um, the 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 more your business develops, the more support is available, really. So, you know, I would encourage you to come back to some more of these webinars. Um, if you then need one to one support with some of our advisors, we've got a group of at least 22 advisors. Leslie's in that group. There are mm -hmm. others. It may be you need to focus. You want to focus on some aspect of your business plan, like the marketing or around the financial side. It might be that you're looking for grants to help you get started. Um, you know, there are there are different people that can support you with different things. Um, and then as your business grows and you start to think about how you how you might then uh, recruit people, we can support you on that journey. It's all fully funded and it's there to help you grow a business that helps grow the economy in Oxfordshire. So, you know, there, there's really no reason not to engage with it. Um, so, yeah, I would hope this is the start of your journey. Um, look forward to seeing all of you at future sessions. Um, any final questions, issues? Doesn't appear to be. Um, so, Leslie, thank you very much for, for sharing that content and helping people here today. Um, it's been brilliant. Not at all. It's, it's, it's lovely to meet you all. Um, I just wish we'd had a bit more time and, you know, I, I don't know what it is you're planning to do. <laughs> so come back to future sessions. Um, my contact details are in the slide pack, actually. And, if you know, but go via Oxlet. Um, I'm more than happy to to have a session with it, with anyone who wants to just talk. You know, there's been a lot today, and sometimes just talking through your ideas and just helps them to to sort of to land and helps you with your priorities. Um, so speak to Ant and the Oxlap team. Is the best thing to do to go through the the little app on the website? Yeah, so we've got a business support tool on the website. I think many of you have probably already been through it already, but we'll share the link for it anyway. Um, but from that, you, if you have, you would get sent a business support action plan, which gives you a, a sort of menu of support that's available. What I would say is that that menu changes regularly. So, you know, every so often it's worth either going back through the business support tool again or emailing Liz O'Hara, who probably sent you the plan and saying, hey, Liz, is there anything changed? Is there anything new that I could be accessing? 